Uh, I, I had a presentation. Um, if somebody can just pull it up. People back here are asleep. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, there's supposed to be a presentation. Anyways, may, maybe um, you guys are in um, post-dinner, um, com- uh, post-lunch coma right now. So this gives us an opportunity to, uh, uh, to tell a joke, I guess. Um, did I ever tell the uh, Deng Xiaoping joke yet? All right. Anyways, more, more newcomers than, 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 uh, than old people here, so, and, which is hopefully going to be apropos to the discussion we're having today. So... A couple of years ago, these guys were in Scotland. You remember they had that sort of G8 summit thing. And, and they ended up getting lost in the marshes in, in some, some golf retreat over there. And in this car, we had this driver, this dude that's driving for the U.S. Secret Service. And in the car, we had Tony Blair and, 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 and George Bush. And then on the other side, <coughs> uh, we had uh, Chirac and, um, and, and Merkel and Hu Jintao. And they're cruising along, and they got lost somehow, and nobody ha- bothered to bring, you know, any sort of GPS device with them. And um, they ended up at this T intersection, and they knew that they're almost going back home, and they take, could take a left, they can take a right, and they're trying to figure out, well, what should they do? So what did they do? They said, don't, they said, well, we're going to take a vote on what to do. So discussion in the back, and uh, of course, being Texan, W raises his hand, he says, I know what we got to do. Of course we got to go right. I mean, we're a capitalist country. You always go right, and you always end up in the right place, right? And Blair, being um, uh, who Blair was, um, he said, well, if Bush says right, I'm going right. Forget about it. I mean, we got that Iraq thing happening. We got to do it. Of course, Bush says right. Chirac has to say left. That Anglo-Saxon French thing you all had going this morning. So, well, we got to go left. So he goes left, and Merkel's saying, well, I got to do the pan-euro thing, you know, I, I got to vote for ye- left. So left in the middle is poor Hu Jintao, and he's sitting there going, he's a tiebreaker. So he says, well, guys, a couple of things. I did remember to bring my Huawei manufactured phone, and I know how to break this crisis. I need to make a phone call, and I got to call Deng Xiaoping. And these guys are like, what do you mean, Deng Xiaoping is still taking phone calls? He's like, yeah, from me. So he calls up Deng Xiaoping, and he's like, uh, I'm a little bit crisis. China's security and image is on the line. What should I do? And then Deng Xiaoping says, well, it's obvious what you should do. What you do is you instruct the driver to put the signal on to turn left, but go right. (laughs) And that's very much, I think, going to summarize China's perspective going forward. Um, Someone said capitalism is going to be what we make it out to be. Um, And I I think there's some logic to that. I mean, I think... um, Capitalism will probably be more close to communism beyond um, uh, the fact that um, they both start with the, the letter C. So, so what I did, because I'm not a smart guy, and they asked me to uh, moderate these smart guys, uh, and this morning we had all these macro theories uh, floating around, is I put together a few um, thoughts, uh, mostly from much smarter guys than me, um, that I thought I'd share with you and hopefully frame the discussion so that we can actually get to the reality of day-to-day life um, sometime before this evening. And um, for context, uh, two weeks ago, and I shared this with Chris, um, I, was, I was rather honored to be invited to a session in Shanghai um, where we had um, f- some big thinking guys. You know, we had John Thornton, who was uh, formerly the um, ex-co-president of Goldman Sachs, one of the... Um, 40 most influential financiers of the last whatever number of years, as rated by whatever magazine. Um, and John is a very insightful, very smart guy about a lot of things in, um, in the financial circles. We had um, uh, uh, Ken Cheneau, who is, I think, one of the most brilliant leaders of corporate America today, um, the chairman and CEO of American Express. But most importantly, we had a guy who is not given as much credit for his, his, his ability as a historian and given probably too much credit for his abilities as a diplomat um, and a security expert, Henry Kissinger. And um, you know, we had this whole chat about the financial crisis and all this kind of stuff. And I vociferously took notes. And I'm using these notes for this presentation that I created during the last session. Um, I throw out my earlier presentation during the last session to set up the discussion today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Henry told us, which I thought was really interesting. Henry said... It's important to understand, in the context of history, what has changed between 2007 and now. 
He says, but probably instead of just thinking back to 2007, just think in eras, and history will define the ending of one era and the beginning of another era. But he says, instead of just looking at the current financial crisis, think about what has actually happened um, and what we're experiencing right now. And he, he, he thought that this thing was driven by sort of three key drivers. So if you think about everything post-World War II, the entire systems that we were, were part of, uh, political, social, economic, were driven by the fact that we had a common adversary. And our common adversary in the West was the East, was communism. And the East's common adversary was the West, us. That was a fabulous balance of power. We constructed systems that allowed for that. So wealth distribution was very important to Russia, whereas in America, you know, being wealthy was very important. Um, and that has just sort of dissipated a little bit. You can argue, by the way, dislike for America, especially in a post-Iraq um, uh, era, is a common adversary, but I would argue not, because I come here and I'm still eating McDonald's, and people still love the fact that I speak like an American in China. So the concept of no common adversary, no shared agenda, no win-win concept, might have been a little bit misplaced. The second thing that uh, Henry pointed out is he says, despite the fact that we, we uh, fought a war in two oceans, in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, if you look at the media, and by the way, he also points out that, well, I can't remember the statistic he used, but I think it was north of 70% of the consumed media in the world comes from the West, uh, which in turn taints uh, perspectives a little bit. But he pointed out that um, there's been a fundamental shift of power from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Again, this is a man who's brilliant. He's just an absolutely brilliant his, uh, uh, historian. And the third thing that he ta ta thought about is what he called a rebalancing, as opposed to a financial crisis, as opposed to a, a crisis of confidence or panic or the different words that we might use. He thought about you know, the rebalancing of the international financial system. Now, it's really interesting. We should have gotten the fact that this rebalancing was going to happen. I mean, keep in mind, 60% of the world's population came online to this system that we created called capitalism in the last 18 years. If you total the populations of India, China, the East Bloc, and parts of Latin America that were previously non-democratic, it's 60% of the people in the world. So you can expect there's going to be a little change in, 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 in this. And his key question was, to what extent is, was the U.S. being overly blamed as being responsible? And on the counter side, to, uh, as the cause, and on the other side, to what extent is there too much expectations of China being the solution? And then his last point was, this is not only a rebalancing of the financial system. You've got to think about mainstream and Wall, Main Street and Wall Street, and maybe this goes beyond just financials. So he thought that if you use those three as drivers, and, and, and I hope Mr. Kissinger doesn't feel I'm blaspheming his words at all. I, I'm trying my best to do a good representation of it as, as, as best as I wrote. So any errors are purely mine, not Mr. Kissinger's. Um, he pointed out that as we look at what might drive the future, what, what, what we can learn from this and what we might be able to drive is the following. He says, the first is, we've really got to make sure that we have a balance between the crisis naturally resolving itself versus over-interventionism. His point was, and somebody mentioned panic again this morning, I think Michael was, uh, the issue is when people are scared, they do stupid things. And so we might want to put that into context. And, and he felt that, that that really came across timing, slow versus fast, uh, macro versus micro, and the impact on capital markets versus the impact on markets themselves. Um, the second thing, and I thought this was really um, insightful, um, he thought that, you know, we, the traditional drivers of the global system, and I thought it was remarkable in the first session this morning, all but one of the discussion revolved around, uh, one of the persons involved in the discussion revolved around a US-centric view of life. Joel's, um, for example, presentations primarily used U.S. statistics. Um, uh, uh, and, and we are constantly going back to that. And of course, the U.S. is the largest economy in the world. But his whole point was there's a natural reluctance for those people that are driving to give up power. And there's, in fact, increasingly now, a natural reluctance for those people that should be driving to assume power, as Yukon will point out, and, uh, and Professor B Bing will point out, uh, the Chinese are not very big power grabbers throughout their 4,000-year history, yet we're actually asking them to do that. 
And that might be an interesting dichotomy for us to think about going forward. But he also points out that it's not only the Chinese that are going to be the new drivers. His point was, how comfortable are we about energy-rich, asset-rich, especially as it pertains to equities-rich companies, like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, like Nigeria, and like Venezuela, playing a bigger role? They can. They got the assets. For a little while, they had us by the proverbial cojones. And um, we didn't like it much, do we? Putin certainly rattled his sword up in the north. And so that dichotomy, he felt that how we, the systems we put in place for managing those balances would really be interesting. Um, he also points out that there's going to be a void in, in this transition that naturally needs to be filled. And if that void isn't filled, people react with even more panic. Hence, I think, uh, John's question this morning about war versus innovation. And so I thought that was an interesting uh, key driver that he pointed out. And then his last point was, this in turn, the counter to all of that is opportunity, opportunity for new leadership, something that since that discussion I've actually been thinking a little bit about. So he talked, talked a little bit about new organizations, new systems, but more importantly about new individuals that are going to lead this charge. I think we heard from uh, a comment from a gentleman who's driving social entrepreneurism, for example, this morning. He pointed out it's not only going to be government leaders that's going to drive this thing, but the private sector today is significantly more important than at any time in the post-World War II era. Mm -hmm. And he thought that more apropos to change is the fact that the largest economy in the world, world is going through a leadership change almost as a reflection of what we need to go through. And so, of course, someone asked him, so what's the um, advice you'd give to the incoming president like Barack, Barack Obama? And he says only one, one word. And ironically, I saw this reflected by an interview with George Bush on Tuesday um, with ABC. He says, the one thing that leaders cannot do is invent the circumstances that they face. And then he went into this whole thing by Immanuel Kant, um, Essays for Universal Peace, which I've subsequently read, and it's an amazing book, by the way. Um, so that's all interesting. And for me, what I'm trying to do is provide a little bit of context based on what we've done this morning. However, most of you that know me at the FTF know <clears throat> that while I'm, I, I love these two and a half days of thinking about stuff uh, twice a year, I'm in the business of making money. I, I, I fundamentally believe that money changes the world. Uh, money can be used to do things that are profound. Gates is proving that to be true. Um, the, Jeff Skoll is proving that to be true. They're, through the media, Gates is doing that through healthcare. And so, for me and my fellow panelists, both of whom I've known over the years of the FTF, for me, I'm wondering, where are we going to go out and create opportunities for value creation? Money is a, is, is a tool for value creation. It could be equity. It could be lives saved. It could be, gosh, more Spanish lunches consumed. I don't care. The key question for me is, how can we learn from these macro drivers and, and turn those into investment opportunities? So I've come up with the Carlos Bola, obvious drivers of the future, which I did, by the way, most of you probably see me clicking away this morning during my presentation. And I think there's five key things that are going to inform investments, um, investment strategies going forward. And I really fundamentally wish my friend and, and, and almost brother, Max Berger, who proposed this topic, was here, because just to hear him comment on these as chairman of Apex, uh, one of the largest private equity firms in the world, would be interesting. But for me, the first thing is globalization has won. We should just give it up. Decoupling is no more. You know, Davos of this year, I was shocked, and Steve Roach from Morgan Stanley, their chief economist at the time, now chairman of Asia, wrote a phenomenal article on this, that he couldn't believe some of the world's foremost minds in January 2008 was having this discussion. Folks, let's get clear. When the U.S. coughs, the rest of the world catches a flu. That's a fact of life. See China for details. I live there. But more importantly, that globalization and those bilateral ties are going to be even more important. When Nigeria coughs, the rest of the world is catching a cold. By the way, Somalia is coughing right now off the coast of Africa, and we are catching colds. The cost of naval supply routes militarily controlled off the coast of Somalia is driving up goods almost as much to compensate almost as much from the decline of the price of oil right now in Africa-Asian trade, and that is a fact. So, Globalization is one. We got no choice. 
We got a, you know, the Indian Navy shooting that vessel down. I loved it. Unfortunately, they had Mumbai after, but that's another story. Um, the second thing is the U.S. is still important. And that's why I loved Joe, the, the counter argument to some of Joel's um, statistics this morning is that you actually set up the case for why the U.S. is still important, why the U.S. is still a significant driver. The U.S. is the largest producer on planet Earth. The US, U.S. is the largest consumer. At 74% of GDP, consumer spending is a ridiculous amount. We're going we're gonna to have stimulus packages that tries to hold that up for the sake of the world, and that is fundamentally brain dead. But we're going to do that because we're the U.S. Um, and lastly, the U.S. is the largest investor, and as we discovered much to our chagrin recently, the largest securitizer. Securitizer meaning the amount of derivatives relative to underlying value went way beyond what is sustainable. Effectively, we leverage our balance sheets by, get this folks, if you do the math, 1,300 years. That's a lot of years. With that kind of numbers, I'm going to go spend all my money on Bacardi rum and party it up because there's no end in sight. But the third thing that I think we really need to recognize from the U.S. is the U.S. plays a very important role in the world. The U.S. military, which has been significantly decried, has provided a free ride for the world. The U.S. military has produced more innovations than we care to imagine post-World War II. In times of stress, the U.S. military is the logistical force that is used to bring benefit and relief to mankind. The United States Centers for Disease Control is the world's hospital. Without that, we would have epidemics beyond belief. So there's that balance. And then lastly, if you're very American, you say to yourself, we need to have an arbiter of morals, of values, of politics of the world. And the U.S. has tried to play that role. We can argue positively or negatively so. But the U.S. will continue to matter. And I live in Shanghai, by the way. So I think that's the second key obvious that we should just agree on and move forward. I think the third is, uh, sorry, the fourth is metrics and governance for the world will go beyond economics. I loved, again, my discussion over dinner last night about social entrepreneurship, a new term that I've, I've heard. I don't buy into, by the way, everywhere in the world Grameen Bank will work and that we will all go and create 1,000 Grameen Banks to replace Goldman Sachs, and that's a good thing. I don't buy that. But I do believe that the definition of happiness or the definition of values are changing to include a little bit more than just wealth. So arguably, your living room is as important as what you're consuming on the TV as the wallet that you have in your purse or in your, in your jacket pocket. And the last is this panacea that the world seems to think is going to be the case here, that China will solve the world's problem, is absolutely brain dead. Let me help you guys with this. And I had a discussion with Professor uh, Bing over, um, over lunch. China has about a trillion dollars in U.S. and about two trillion dollars, depending on the time of the day and where the U.S. currency is, um, in foreign reserves. Now, I'm going to guarantee you guys, any of you guys ask Hu Jintao, what are you worried about? The 400 billion you got in Fannie Mae being supported by the U.S. Treasury Department, the current trading or volatility of the U.S. Treasuries, or some internal issues, what are you most worried about? And I'll guarantee you that the number one thing that he's probably going to tell you is, you know, we still got 700 million poor people in China. And those $2 trillion are not the Americans' $2 trillion. They're not the Europeans' $2 trillion. They're not even my $2 trillion. They're those 1.3 billion people that elected me to take care of them. So even if you were to apply the $2 trillion, even if you were to suspend your animation and think the $2 trillion are going to solve the problem, it actually would create a bigger problem because the balance between those 700 million internally and the 600 million that are quotes on quotes well off in China is of bigger concern to us in Shanghai, China. So my view is very simple. If you take those five as, and I'm sure there's a lot of smart people that are going to come up with probably like 15 more of those, but those are for me the five obvious drivers of the future. It then says to me as an investor, um, wherever this thing is, we are good places to invest. And if I've got 10 bucks, where am I putting my 10 bucks? So in order of priority, and I prioritize them in terms of time frames, I'm going to share as a provocative statement with my colleagues where I put my money. And then more importantly, I'm going to ask the smarter investment guys to come up and tell you where they're putting their monies or advising others to put their monies. So here's the good news part of life. The first is all those countries that are going out and spending on national stimulus packages. 
boy, would I like to be the parasite on the elephant's butt going after those. Think about that. Barack is going to come in in January, and on January 20th, he's going to go, gosh, you know what? What W has done so far is not enough. We've got to create 2 million jobs. Where's the obvious place to create 2 million jobs? Let's fix the U.S. highway system, because that worked in the 50s, right? And uh, what else do we need? We need some new hospitals. Come on, let's throw some monies on that. And all I want to do is be the construction company that's doing a little bit of that. Similarly, if you look at national stimulus packages in China, it's to spur consumer spending as opposed to consumer savings. So guess what I'm investing in in China? Anything you will buy directly. I don't want to invest in the business that's going to sell it to you. I want to invest in you directly. Please buy it from me directly, as an example. So I think these, stimulus, these national stimulus packages that are primarily focused on consumer spending increases and infrastructure are wonderful areas to invest in. The second thing I think, and this is for us financial guys in the room, is uh, I used to be an ex-investment banker post being a consultant, and this is where I actually made a fair bit of my own personal net worth, um, is in rational securitization. Here's the problem. All those securities have been issued, they're going to get repriced. They're going to get re-chopped up, they're going to get rebundled, and all you people that don't have good tolerance for risk management, you're going to want to dump them into the market. So if give you an example. If you look at where blue chip debt is trading right now, so, by the way, Honeywell is not going to go out of business in the next three months. Neither is United Technologies, neither is GE, right? Just three random American companies. If you look at where you can buy their debt right now on a convertible debt spread, you are cleaning up. You're cleaning up. Why? Nobody wants to hold the paper. Everybody's selling the paper. If you got cash, you buy it, you reprice, you resell. Everybody's happy. You still make your money. That capitalist system, it's still working. So I think the repricing, the rebalancing, and the rebundling of existing securities that are considered not investment grade is a really good opportunity. I think buying securities from people that don't have any more the oomph for playing the game that they were telling us that they could play before, I'll buy it at 22 cents, 10 cents on the dollars. We've seen even cross-border examples of that. The Japanese went in and saved Morgan Stanley. They could have repriced the Morgan Stanley securities they bought. They didn't because they knew they were getting a good enough deal. Don't mess with it. Take it. We'll add some more in later. We're going to see more of that. A uh, gentleman from Tomasic is here. I, do, I still don't understand why GIC and Tomasic isn't getting in and being really aggressive about that. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity. And finally, I think there's going to be new securities that we're going to derive where the ratio of derivatives to underlying asset values are going to be more rational. And he who issues that and under, underwrites that with real hard cash wins big time. So I'm really happy about that. I think there's a fantastic opportunity in the financial markets today. Uh, the third category I'm going to talk about um, here is new consumer groups and markets. Um, like I mentioned earlier, 60% of the world's population just discovered capitalism. And if you're in China, we've got a lot of those stuffed as R&B bills in our mattresses. We're going to spend a little bit of that now. So what are we going to buy? China Mobile is not crying. They keep selling you SMSs and ringtones or whatever you want to buy. So for me, I think that, that, that investors that are targeting those new consumer groups, whether they're geographically defined or demographically defined, I mean, I, I went to this uh, Singapore Formula One uh, Grand Prix party, and I was shocked by consumption. I mean, this was during the crisis. And, um, and so I, th I think that there's significant new demographics that are going to be showing up um, that are worth targeting. Um, then now, now sort of uh, transitioning into some of the new areas that I think that, that are not as well defined and we're going to have to be a little bit more clever about investing in um, are these two areas. The world still has some significant unsolved problems that are still out there. You know, a big part of the world is still hungry. So investing in food is still not such a bad thing after all. Um, the Red Bull guys have even discovered that. Um, healthcare is still there. In China, for example, healthcare, the, the actual uh, uh, healthcare services business, the distribution and provisioning of healthcare, um, is still a fantastic uh, investment opportunity. So, in emerging markets, I think you're going to see the traditional infrastructure, education, nutrition, um, uh, uh, healthcare areas quite attractive. And then, lastly, and, and John, you preempted me this morning, is this, this whole issue of innovation. Um, I think there's going to be significant innovation, that innovations that are going to continue that we can invest in. Um, I'm very excited about this new wealth distribution and how the new banks, for example, are going to play in there. I want to see um, Fernando this morning over, um, over breakfast was telling me about a business that he's involved in where he's allowing people that can't um, uh, uh, pay their mortgage 
to trade down into a new home without having to negotiate their mortgage. We're going to see more and more and more of those types of innovative services come on, on, online. I think those are exciting to invest in. I think we're going to see this large theme of moving away from fossil fuels, trying to make sure that if and when oil goes back to, to north of 60 bucks, which it inevitably will, that some of us have an arbitrage, a hedge against that, um, both from the capital market standpoint, but with respect to new businesses uh, that, are, that are going to be doing that. And lastly, I really continue be to believe, if you look at IT penetration on a consumer basis and on a, on a business basis, uh, on an enterprise basis, it is still very low. Um, dollars spent per MIPS, per bytes, and or per, per kilobits per second um, on a per capita basis is still way lower than what we spend on chocolate per year. So that tells me there's hope for increased investments in what I do, which is in the information technology business. So all of that being said, I, I was trying to provide a platform for the discussion uh, that my colleagues are, are, are going to take even further um, on a go-forward basis. There's some pessimism, there's some optimism, but for me, there's overall opportunity that's out there, and it's just a matter of us identifying where we're going to go get that. So that being said, I'm going to introduce you to, to, to Gilles. Um, he, uh, Jill is um, a long time, I guess, member. Um, the first time we met was uh, five years ago? Three. Yeah, here on, on the China um, FTF. And he will tell you a little bit about um, his view of the investment world. Um, thereafter, uh, uh, we will have an interesting um, uh, inv in investor who went from Allianz, the company that's kind of having some issues right now, to a company called Foreign and Colonial. Um, which could not be a more appropriate name for what we're going to be um, uh, talking about, and how he views investment, and what I think is really, really, really excited about uh, his view, and, and happens to be a very good friend of mine, um, is he will talk about, uh, on a personal basis, about what he saw when he was in Asia, and now that he's back in London, what the world is like. And then um, what would be great is to um, involve uh, all of us in, in, in an active debate. So please, Jill. <laughs> 